magnetic resonance imaging. The thing is, it has not only a very great soft tissue contrast. In fact, when we try to see the multiplanar acquisition, it's also present with this unique tool, in fact. And yes, it does not have any ionizing radiation. It is a non-invasive uh, tool, in fact. And the best thing is, if you want to see the anatomic and functional diagnosis, so it's really helpful, in fact. But the problem is, uh, whenever you are trying to see, is uh, you are trying to see for the coronary calcifications, it may be difficult, especially when you try to compare with the CT imaging. So that's one of definitely the problems. So, what are the contraindications of this testing? So, like other testing modalities, it also does have. So, for example. If someone is having is um, uh, you know that uh, that uh, we are aware that the gadolinium which we use it with this it does not have uh, much toxic effect on the uh, kidneys like the other contrasts and all. So that is one of the good things. In fact, to tell you very frankly, so this is a common misnomer which a lot of people tend to think like okay. If there is someone with sternal wire or prosthetic heart valve or even joint replacement as well, or retained epicardial pacing lead or, uh, you know, the vascular stent or the coronary stent, can it be scanned? Definitely, yes, it can be stand, uh, scanned without any problem. Similarly, then comes the point of like the cardiac uh, occluder devices. And if someone has been fitted with a vena uh, cava filter. So for example, a lot of uh, people who have get complaints of recurrent thromboembolic phenomenons and all, or even someone with embolization coil as well, it's not at all a problem. So I, I would say like, yeah, it's ideally it is recommended to wait for like minimum is six weeks uh, is recommended. Similarly, if uh, someone is already uh, having a permanent pacemaker or AICD and all, yes, they do say that it is a relative contraindication. However, to tell you very frankly, nowadays there are MRI safe pacemakers which can be used. So even for that, what we try to say it like this, okay, give after implantation, maybe give a time of like around six weeks. And after that, it's pretty fine. And yes, if someone is having a ferromagnetic cerebrovascular aneurysm clips, they should not be exposed, I would say. So anything which is containing a ferromagnetic thing, the iron uh, stuff in the implant or in the rings and all, it should be completely avoided. So if there's a patient with a temporary pacing device or a hemodynamic support device or like a IABP and all, it is a contraindication for sure. And uh, although, uh, you know, during pregnancy it is, uh, we all are aware there are no relative no, or no known risks so far, but it's said it is better to avoid at least during the first trimester, okay? And uh, yeah, and after that, if there's a need for any urgent diagnosis, definitely it can be used. So what is the thing is, uh, yes, there are several technical challenges uh, which is associated, for example, what happens is the heart's motion or the pulsality of the great vessels can be pretty challenging to uh, image and especially the systolic ventricular blood velocity up to 200 centimeter per second is indeed uh, not easy to image or even to be able to capture as well and the thing is um, yeah if we try to uh, do it uh, with ECG gating or the eco respiratory gating or the breath hold technique or similarly other techniques like uh, the 
when we try to do a cardiac gating as well. So it tends to improve not only the field homogeneity, but also it tends to increase the pulse sequences as well. So that's why it is very important and it is pretty helpful. So some of the things which we all should remember during um, um, the how to do the cardiac MRI. So, okay, cardiac MRI has already been ordered. So what to do about it? So we should try to know that, for example, the ECG leads, always try to make sure that, okay, the cables are aligned parallel to the bore and they should not be allowed to form loops. So for example, you know, it can be making it difficult even for the patients as well. Similarly for the coils, okay? So the coils, there should be head coil in the end fans. Otherwise if for the adults, there should be torso phased array co coils, in fact, okay? And when we are trying to see for the position, it should be anterior or posterior. So for example, this is how we, as we can see it, right? So this is what is the cardiac coil and how it should be placed for the patients. So as you can see it clearly, the ECG, the, there's a special way in which the ECG should be kept like this. Okay? And for example, for the breathing, as you can see it over here, this is how it should be kept. The ECG placement depends upon the type of the ECG gating design. So there are different uh, twisted or braided configuration of long wires, as you can see, for example, the first one or the second one, in fact. And uh, see, the other thing also to be kept in mind is, especially being in cardiology is the ECG wires, if they are too lengthy, they should be either twisted or braided. So as we can now notice over here, so whenever we are keeping these ECG leads, uh, how we keep it and the polarity what we get is very important. I think. So that is why the ECG, how it is being kept, it is very important. So for example, this is the, the plus one, as you can see the first figure, and then comes is the negative, and then is the neutral. So, so what is going to happen is if they are going to be kept far apart, the amplitude of course is going to be uh, really minimum. And then if the electrodes are repositioned, okay, when you can see along to the lead polarity, it will be getting adjusted and you want to have improved R wave detection, okay, because on the basis of that, you will give the diagnosis of also the arrhythmia and similarly, you can also gate the imaging as well. So something is called as trigger W, uh, trigger window. So what happens is the waiting period before each R wave is often called the trigger window. And there's a time delay, which is usually expressed as a percentage of R to R interval, where the system stops scanning and waits for the next R wave. So that is what is called as the trigger window. So uh, in the ECG, as you can see it very well, so how it looks like. And if the trigger window is set as 10% of the actual delay, so it will be how many milliseconds? So that will be 1000 milliseconds. So minus the 10% of the resultant time for the slice acquisition is going to be 900 milliseconds. So this is what is called as the imaging time. So the imaging is not going to happen throughout the 1000 milliseconds. So it is going to happen only during the 900 milliseconds. So there's something called as trigger delay. So what happens is this is the waiting uh, period, okay? So what happens is the delay after the trigger or trigger delay. So there's always a slight hardware delay between the, the system detection, uh, detecting which tends to after the RF and the transmitting RF uh, to excite the first slides. And this is usually in the order of a few milliseconds. And this period can often be extended. However, to delay the acquisition of the slices until the heart is in diastole and is therefore relatively still. So the imaging time is available to acquire slices, or which is available time is 
R R to R interval minus trigger window plus trigger delay. So what is the actual timing? So as we can see it over here beautifully in this ECG, not all of the time is available for the machine to do the cardiac imaging. And that's why the getting of the white blood images allows the evaluation of dynamic cardiac function and the physiology throughout the cardiac cycle. For example, the motion of the myocardium and valve leaflets and the images are typically reviewed in the cineform. And that's why the gating in the black blood images tends to serve to time image acquisition during the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle, thereby limiting the cardiac motion artifact. So in the cardiac gating is like two ways of gating. One is a prospective gating, another is retrospective gating. In the prospective gating, the R wave triggers data acquisition and the RF excitation is continuous, although the data acquisition is not continuous and measurement of the blood flow is definitely not possible. However, in the retrospective gating, data acquisition is continuous. And in fact, if someone is having arrhythmias, so this is the one which is really advocated. So for example, uh, elective physiologists, so for those arrhythmia patients and all, retrospective should be uh, used to tell you uh, a mnemonic what i try to remember is rr arrhythmia has double r so retrospective it should be done so and the good thing is yes you can uh, allow uh, the measurement of the blood flow as well although problem is yes it is more time consuming so as you can see what is the difference between the prospective gating and the retrospective gating so the acquisition tends to happen for a longer time in the retrospective. However, in the prospective gating, it is for a pretty smaller duration. Now coming to this uh, wonderful diagram. So it is trying to give you a, a practical example if how long it is being done. Okay. So uh, there are different imaging techniques like the blood technique, or uh, using the dark blood and the bright blood, which we already said it, and then comes the imaging sequences, and also the imaging plane as well. So there are various pulse sequences. Pulse sequences, what will happen is, for example, if you are trying to see for the uh, anatomy, otherwise the dynamic and angiography, or for example, for the gradient echo, or even for uh, your, you try to do a phase contrast. So for example, if you're trying to quantify the flow, Similarly, you try to use the delayed enhancement. If you are trying to come in for a heart, which has had like infiltration is there, there's infarct is there, or there's any inflammation. Similarly, if there's a case of uh, like, uh, when you want to do the angiography, so uh, you try to do the catalinium assisted MRA. And if you want to do some tagging, so you have to do the physiologically in fact. So, what happens is in the black uh, blood imaging. So they tend to be produced with the MR pulse sequences that the null signal from flowing blood for better visualization of cardiac and mediastinal anatomy and vascular wall pathology. You are able to see the anatomy, also the pericardial abnormalities and the mediastinal abnormalities as well. And even when we try to see for the extra luminal aortic diseases, so that's something really amazing. And the thing is, whenever we are trying to see uh, for the T1 and a T2 weighted spin echo sequence, so then we have to do is the fast or turbo spin technique. So again, we are trying to see in this how the inversion time, inversion time is uh, it takes or affects the imaging. So what happens is the non-selective means the first 180 degree of the pulse will invert all spins within the entire active volume to transmit coil. And the second 180 degree, the pulse is going, is specially selective. It means that its effects are restricted to the single slice being imaged. So that's why 
sometimes we have to also understand what is the dark blood double IR sequence. So after two inversion pulses, the tissue within the slice is unaffected, okay? But the magnetization of the blood outside the slice is inverted. As this blood flows into the slice for imaging, it is going to produce no signal since uh, the TI is chosen as null its signal. The image acquisition mode is typically 2D fast. And so that's where comes now the role of bright blood. So bright blood is definitely very important. And in fact, we all understand that high signal intensity of the fast flowing blood. Typically, especially uh, in cardiology, we have really great usage, in fact. And uh, recently, it has been introduced the technical term of STD, state free precession. So what is called as SSFP, okay? So there are definite uh, sequences for that and uh, which can be used like the FISP. FISP is standing for fast imaging with steady state precession. And FIESTA, FIESTA stands for fast imaging employing steady state acquisition. So in the steady state imaging, what we try to do is residual transverse magnetization is used, okay? And the initial RF pulse tends to tilt the magnetization vector partially into transverse plane, okay? And the subsequent RF pulse knocks the magnetization vector back and forth and across the z-axis. And that's why the appearance is similar to a metronine, which is used in the music. So in the figure, as you can see, this is the metronine, which is used. That's the, that is the reason due to which we can get a transverse and a longitudinal magnetization, which tends to enter a steady phase and not just a longitudinal magnetization. So yes, it has its advantages and disadvantages as well. For example, uh, the images will be having a T1 and T2 weighting as well. Okay, and since transverse magnetization is added, uh, we can reach uh, the steady state quickly. And also, uh, we are uh, able to use the residual transverse magnetization as well. So it does not waste it, okay? So on an overall basis, that's why, uh, the blood images is really attributable to the inherent T1 and T2 signal. And therefore, what is happening is the TR does not have to be lengthened to wait for the fresh spines to enter the slides. Uh, and we can do the prospective, retrospective gating as well, about which we talked. And of course, uh, a cardiac cycle is made from multiple cycles. So that's something really good. So for example, this is how it typically looks like. A spin echo versus the gradient echo. And now coming to the phase contrast. So the phase contrast includes the magnitude and the phase images. And it is definitely a key for the quantitative measurements of flow and velocities and volumes as well. And uh, the planes, so there are definite planes which can be used, the true planar, which includes the axial, sagittal, the coronal sections, which is used also in the CT imaging and all. Then comes, if you want to uh, do for the two chamber, okay, so you can do is the long axis, the short axis, and finally, the four chamber, which includes the horizontal long axis. So this is how this two, um, chamber and the four chamber imaging looks like. So this is what is the typical left ventricular wall regional uh, regions which are seen on the standard imaging views. So the first one is the left atrium, the left ventricle, you can see it like this, and the septum and the different uh, images which is seen during the three chamber view, two chamber view, and finally the four chamber view. So on ground reality, when you are trying to do the planned acquisition, this is how it typically looks like. And now this is the, whenever you're trying to comment on the regional wall motion abnormality, you try to see on the three levels, like the typical echo, base, mid, apex, okay? <clears throat> so these are the different segments. 
So for example, you try to comment on the 17 segments and you can try to, of course, comment on the regional wall motion optimality. So as I said, if you try to uh, see, it is pretty much similar to the cardiac echo. And on the basis of that, you can, of course, comment on the, uh, which is the possible vessel which is getting affected as well, right? So this is pretty much similar. So this is the imaging, how it typically looks like. For example, when we are trying to do for the cardiac MRI, but you should be able to comment. What about the different segments? So for example, the, uh, the arch, the aorta is going, then the arch of aorta, then the ascending aorta, the right pulmonary artery, the left atrium, then comes the right ventricle. But of course, the, the images which you capture, it will depend upon which segment you are trying to focus upon as well. So now here you can see about the right atrium, then comes the pulmonary artery at the left ventricle. So these are the different uh, chambers of the heart which you are able to visualize. So now coming to the, what are the other various indications? So for example, if uh, there's ischemic heart disease, you want to comment about the myocardial viability or the perfusion. And if, uh, how about the bypass graft patency? Also, you can try to have a look. You can also try to have a look about the global and regional ventricular function. And you're, if you're trying to quantify the ventricular volume, and similarly, if there's congenital heart disease as well, and if there's a pericardial disease as well, uh, which you would like to really comment upon, it is very important, in fact, okay? So this imaging tool definitely uh, can be used for a lot of, a lot of, uh, in fact, I would say uh, fields and also a lot of kind of patients as well. So this is the best thing about this. Okay. Are there any confusions so far? I hope it is uh, good and you are able to understand. So one of the other important things which we all should be trying to keeping in mind is uh, the, how put the potential for, so for example, one of the most important tests, uh, can anyone recall or what do you think is one of the most important tests we can do, especially using the cardiac MRI for our patients? Okay, I'll try to give you a hint. It's an ischemic heart disease. So in ischemic heart disease, I would say like, what is the, what are the most special uh, use of this? So what is called as the myocardial viability. So what is happening is that this functional myocardium is subtended by a disease coronary artery having limited or absent scarring. And that is what has the potential for functional recovery. And that is what is called as the, the myocardial viability. So even in that, there are different uh, definitions for that. So something like a viable myocardium. So viable myocardium is the one which is alive and has no regard to the contractile state. Then comes the stunned myocardium. Stunned myocardium is the one with viable myocardium and has a reversible contractile dysfunction following brief ischemic insult, which, is, which can last for like hours to days after this, after the myocardial infarction. And how about repetitive ischemia? So for example, a patient can be having a chronic stunning, having a normal resting flow. And then finally, there is hibernating myocardium. Hibernating myocardium is the one in the setting of a chronic ischemia. And that is the viable. 
So to tell you very frankly, so stunt myocardium is in acute setting. Hibernating myocardium is the one in the chronic ischemia. So there is contractile dysfunction, although if you revascularize them, it will be a hibernating. And yes, there's a reduced resting flow as well. So uh, whenever you're trying to see for the myocardial uh, viability in the infarcted uh, myocardium, the viable myocardium is going to exhibit the contractile dysfunction at baseline, but recovery over time. So what is happening is if there's a spontaneousness after myocardial stunning and otherwise after the re-establishment of coronary blood flow. So in the case of myocardial hibernation, and that's why stunned myocardium is usually a tr transient phenomenon, which is seen after ischemia, often in the setting of occluded coronary artery. And with chronically impaired maxima, uh, uh, perfusion, such as, for example, in case of like severe coronary artery disease, hibernation can happen with a chronic wall motion normality. And yes, CMR, cardiac MRI, can definitely differentiate between a, a viable myocardium and also the area of infarction. Okay, since in the former, as I said, it the significant wall motion normality is present, but late enhancement is absent. And late enhancement is done actually with the gadolinium for the differentiation. And we all are aware the MR imaging is uh, also important, for example, for the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, especially in the patients who are having symptoms of myocardial infarction, but outside the diagnostic time frame or altered cardiac enzymes. So, for example, if some, there is elevated troponins, but uh, patient also has a kidney disease as well. So it may be having a confusing picture. So that's where you want to see like, okay, which is due to which problem. So that is the row time. You can also ask for this test and you will be able to notice it actually. So it is definitely, even for example, for a chronic myocardial infarction as well, you will be able to differentiate it from non-ischemic cardiomyopathy especially with the usage of delayed enhancement pattern. And uh, because what is happening is uh, you will be able to notice an inadequate supply of oxygenated blood, particularly when the ischemia exceeds a critical threshold. Okay. So for example, now I'll try to show you, this is the typical ischemic cascade. So initial thing always happens is there will be a perfusion deficit which leads to systolic dysfunction. Only after all these things, you can see a ECG change. And finally, after the ECG changes has happened, a chest pain will happen. And finally is the infarction. Okay? And even in the ischemic cascade, if you'll try to look, initially is the stenosis, which will lead to perfusion deficit, finally to the wall motion abnormality, and finally to the ECG changes, and then to the angina. So that is why Initial thing is always a perfusion deficit. So that is why these tests are very, very sensitive, for example, for patients like this to be able to comment on the uh, perfusion uh, deficit. So that is very important and very uh, nice, in fact. So similarly, on the wavefront phenomenon of myocardial ischemic cell death, when we try to have a look, we can comment uh, on the uh, various timings. So in timing wise, so in the times of, if there is a reversible injury, as we can see it over here, initially will be stunning, preconditioning or tissue viability will be seen. Although of course, in the initial 20 minutes, there's no necrosis at all. Then comes the stage of irreversible injury. So irreversible injury, you can again further differentiate into three stages. In the first one, there will be some endocardial necrosis. So where there is going to be salvage of the outer layers. And then in the next three years, three hours, in which the necrosis is going to extend into the mid myocardium and also the sub epicardium. And then the final stage, where there will be near transmural infarction. And there's no salvage of tissue, but 
may lead to the negative LV model. So there are various protocols which is followed for this, like the CNA MRI, CEMR, the stress imaging, or also the myocardial tagging, in which one will be able to see the characteristic regional thinning of the myocardium with akinesia, which suggests the myocardial infarction. Okay, and the exact delineation of damaged myocardium is then performed using the technique of late enhancement with gadolinia. So now I'll try to show you some of those stress protocols. So what are those stress protocols which is being used? So whenever uh, there one can use is a, a Cine MRI or T2 MRI or perfusion MRI or DMRI. So in which we can not only comment upon the contractile function, the myocardial edema, the myocardial blood flow, or also the myocardial necrosis as well. So using them, one can comment on the systolic function or the infarct ease or the area which is at risk as similarly all the myocardial ischemia or in fact also the infarct size or the viability. So various techniques are, which is being used as uh, the HAST Excel for the anatomy, the true FISP CNA for the localizing. Okay, so the, these uh, can be typical multiple choice questions which can be used for a student during the MRCP or any of these board cardiology exams as well. So I would really like you all uh, not to ignore these points and really imbibe these points, okay? Um, can anyone recall what are that uh, whenever you're trying to comment using the cardiac MRI, what are the function, uh, what are the, how is it reported a cardiac MRI? Can anyone recall for me? It mainly talks about the perfusion, sir, to the myocardium. Good, good, wonderful, and and um, viability. Good, nice, and so most of the things we have already spoken. Oh, okay. So we try to report if there is a cardiac MRI which is done. We try to comment on the global function, the segmental function, the segments which I said it like compared to the echocardiography. You also try to comment about the assessment of the delayed hyper enhancement as well, isn't it? Because that's what we are trying to uh, be helpful to the patient because we are not trying to order a test just for the sake of testing. We mm -hmm. are trying to see for those things as well. And of course, finally about the viability assessment. Even for that, as I had already said it, the 17 segment heart model, which is followed in according to the proposed uh, different uh, coronary arteries, it is very much similar to the model which is followed in the coronary uh, echocardiogram. And just, so for example, this is the 17 segment heart model, which I had already said it. So this we can already say base, mid apex, okay? And then you try to see, for example, on the basis of the coronary arteries, okay? on the basis of the coronary arteries, how you will be commenting on the, which coronary artery is commenting the regional wall motion abnormality. So this is how you try to divide the wall. Oppo F7, can you please mute your microphone? Oppo F7. Gosh, how to meet these people? Okay, so now coming to the segments, so if we try to look carefully, we try to see for the movement of the cardiac MRI, also not just in Sicily. But of course, also in the diastole as well. We try to see in these different segments 
about the delayed enhancement imaging. So, in fact, this is one of the most important technique for the evaluation of myocardial infarction patients. And you will be able to diagnose the myocardial infarction or the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And also, you are able to quantify the scar. Hello, Oppo of Seven. Yen Matartira Swami. Hello. Uh, where are our, our moderators? Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Swami. Yin Suna Itra Matartira. Okay, so we were here at the uh, the delayed enhancement imaging. As I was telling you, so this is great help, especially when you're trying to think for the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or quantifying the scar and also assessing the viability as well. And also if you're trying to assess any thrombus, you can comment using this. And hyper enhancement is seen as a bright area of tissue against the backdrop of dark normal myocardium. So I'll try to show you some of the images as well, which you can see it over here. So in two chamber and the short axis view. So uh, there is delayed enhancement in these areas, which tends to show the full thickness to the delayed enhancement in the base, mid and apex, anterior and anteroceptral segment in the LED distribution. And the three chamber and the short axis delayed enhancement images. So it, this is how it looks like in the other patient. Tr uh, when there is a transmural hyper enhancement in the basal and mid intro lateral inferior segment. So what it means? The, it means there is an infarct in the left circumflex territory. Let me try to give you <coughs> more practical example. So there is a long axis late enhancement image. So this was done like almost after one week after the infarction. So I will try to give you some examples of myocardial stunning about which we spoke. In the myocardial stunning, which I was telling you, this, so myocardial stunning, as I was telling you, it, it is done within just few hours of the myocardial infarction. So there is a layer of viable tissue, which you can see it over here, which is surrounded by the non-contractile tissue. And that is why it is called as myocardial stunning, which we already defined it. So let's try to have a closer look. How does it look like on a closer look? So this is how it is. And one of the other important tests, which we can use, especially using the cardiac MRI, is called as the perfusion imaging. So the Perfusion imaging, especially it is important, for example, for the peri-infarct ischemia. And this is normally performed after the pharmacological stress with either using adenosine or dipyridamol or uh, even again at the rest, approximately 15 minutes after the stress imaging to allow blood pool wash out of gadolinium chelate. And the intravenous gadolinium proposes or produces T1 shortening of the normal myocardium resulting in bright signal on T1 weighted images. And that's why the hypoperfused areas tend to appear as dark myocardium on the images. And the multi-section T1 weighted 2D sequences are typically used for the perfusion images. So the MRI perfusion is typically used using the gadolinium, okay? And there's rapid imaging, which is after the just giving the bolus injection. And you can uh, notice uh, the infarcted or the hyperperfused area tends to appear black. However, the normal area is going to appear uh, white. 
as you can see in this image. And yes, stress imaging is really important. And yeah, if you want to increase the accuracy, you have to do it with the Cine MR. Seeing is believing, isn't it? So that's why let's try to show you some of those, uh, how it looks like. So for example, below images, refer to a patient with, or, or a person, I would say, with normal, okay? However, the, the one in the top, these are the patients with coronary artery disease. So in the different segment we, which we can see. So initially, when we are trying to uh, do the myocardial perfusion, initially it appears pretty normal, right? However, when we try to uh, do the adenosin stress testing, so we can see the patient with significant left, left circumflex stenosis and we can also notice the reversible perfusion deficit in the lateral segments. So there is definite difference between the baseline and, and after the stress testing has been done, right? So there is definitely significant, uh, I mean, uh, there's, uh, but, but the other thing as well, if everyone will recall that dobutamine stress echo as well, we do, right? Uh, normally with the echocardiography. So even over here, the cine images can be obtained after infusion of the low dose dobutamine. So for example, like five to 10 microgram per kg per minute, it can be given and one can try to see for the contractile reserves of the myocardium, the areas of the dysfunctional myocardium, which tends to show overall improved wall motion and also the wall thickening. Wall thickening will be said uh, only when there's difference of like two millimeters during the systole with dobutamine, okay? And it tends to indicate the presence of viable myocardium. And this additional sign of residual viability is in diastolic thickness, which is more than 5.5 millimeter. And that's why, so what happens is, yes, T2 weighted imaging is most useful for detecting the presence of edema, which is a marker of acute ischemic injury and also enables the assessment of areas at risk. And one of the other important things is we should be able to comment about is acute myocarditis, myocarditis or even the acute pericarditis. So what happens is after the uh, T1 gated fast GRE images uh, is acquired like after 15 minutes of the contrast administration, one can notice the early hyper enhancement typically for acute myocarditis. However, if that thing is going to happen in the pericardium, so that is what is called as the acute pericarditis. Okay, so let's try to show you some of the images. So this, these images are like end systolic uh, images, okay? So there is inducible ischemia, which is identified, how it is identified, dobutamine stress echo has been done. So at base level at 10 microgram per kg, 20 microgram per kg, and 30 microgram per kg per minute. And when we try to see, as you can already notice, there is regional wall motion abnormality in the anterior and infralateral walls as well. So what is happening over here? So this is another uh, thing same, similarly for the detection of the ischemia. Then one of the important things which I said it is, how about the viability after, if the already the infarction has happened. So you try to see that even with all this imaging and all, if there is a no reflow zone or hypo enhanced zone. So that is what is called as the uh, viable zone, okay? So what happens is, there will be, uh, this tends to happen is due to the microvascular obstruction. There will be, of course, severe ischemic disease, which is mostly the transmural myocardial infarction. And yes, it is associated with uh, poor 
prognosis. Is it possible to comment uh, or di uh, differentiate between the acute and the chronic myocardial infarction with these tools? Yes, it is possible. So what happens is the normally wall thickening is a, uh, normally a feature of acute myocardial infarction, but also the chronic myocardial infarction as well. However, the microvascular obstruction is, if you see the microvascular obstruction, it's 100% characteristic of acute myocardial infarction. However, uh, but when it comes to like seeing, you will be able to see mostly like in like 50%, not all of the patients as well. So if you really want to differentiate if it is the acute or chronic myocardial infarction, you should try to use the T2 weighted imaging. And that's where on the basis of the edema, it will be able to comment. So for example, if it is uh, those imaging typicalities I associated however with edema, yes, it is an acute myocardial infarction. If edema is not there, it is a chronic one. So what happens is how to differentiate? Is it a normal stunt or hibernating or what type is it? So when we try to see, for example, in the wall motion or the scarring, so it will be either normal or impaired. Similarly, for the scarring as well, how much is the percentage of scarring? So on the basis of that, you will be able to see that it is a normal stunt hybrid eating or even infarcted as well. So if you're trying to see uh, what about the comprehensive uh, MRI approach for dysfunctional myocardium, so this is how you try to see, okay? So the, on the basis of the wall motion abnormality, you can try to comment if either is it normal or hyper enhanced as well. Similarly, when you try to see it over here about the systolic function as well, you can try to comment whether there's viable hibernating or 50% chance of improvement or like the non-viable uh, as well. So when you try to do the imaging, okay, so if there's DMRI is present, yes, then you will see coronary artery disease. However, if you do a stress perfusion on the basis further, you can say if it is non-coronary artery disease, but, and then you do a rest perfusion. So again, further, if there is reversible defect, you will be able to say that there is coronary artery disease. However, if there is matched defect, there's no coronary artery disease. So these are the typical examples which we can see it over here in the different patients. How does it look like? So this imaging are very, very important as well. I would really like you all to uh, go through these uh, special images if you really want to do something in the cardiac imaging. Then coming to the myocardial tagging. What happens is strain can be defined as a local fractional change in the length of myocardium as it shortens, okay? Negative strains, otherwise if it lengthens, it will be called as the positive strain. So the quantitative measurement of the strain pattern tends to change the requires determination of precise tag position by using the different algorithms. So can anyone recall how does it look like the myocardial tagging? Okay, now our timing is a bit short. So I, this is how is typical example here, how it looks like in the systole and diastole as well. So ischemic heart disease, we all learned, but also in non-ischemic heart disease as well, it has various examples. Uh, like when we are trying to see, for example, the ventricular function, if there's a patient of cardiomyopathy, or even if, uh, for example, for the valve function, like the stenosis or regurgitation as well. Similarly, if you're trying to see for a cardiac tumor, and similarly, if there's a post-contrast delayed enhancement in assessing, diagnosing, or prognosis of major disease, for example, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, or even the infiltrative myocardial diseases like 
the sarcoidosis or uh, the myocarditis as well. So in the various uh, cardiomyopathies, if we can see it over here, uh, it has a big role. So this is how it looks like in a typical way. Why am, am I telling is if it is a ischemic or non-ischemic? And similarly, in the non-ischemic as well, you can try to comment if it is a dilated cardiomyopathy or myocarditis or if in just hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or sarcoidosis as well, or the Fabry disease or the Chagas disease. Similarly, whether if it is a transmural infarct or if it is really in the non-ischemic side, if you see a epicardial hyperenhancement, then of course you can come into it is sarcoidosis, myocarditis, or even Chagas disease as well. Okay. And the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I think you all will agree uh, about the echocardiographic uh, parameters, yes. But even on the cardiac MRI, we will be able to see a smaller LV cavity, which may be obliterated sometimes in the severe cases. And yes, it can be asymmetric whenever the indiastolic thickness of the septum to post lateral wall is more than 1.5. Then one can also see the diastolic dysfunction with reduced LV compliance and the relatively preserved systolic function as well. And uh, we can also uh, sometimes be able to notice the asymmetric septal hypertrophy and also the SAM, SAM is systolic anterior uh, motion of the anterior mitral leaflet. So let me try to give you some of the examples. So as you can see over here, the yellow uh, marker is pointing to the left ventricular outflow obstruction although the blue one is the one which is pointing to the SAM. And yes, the red arrow is the one which is uh, pointing to the mitral regurgitation. So when you are trying to see for the SAM, systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet, as you can see it over here in the LV outflow. This is a beautiful image. A very beautiful image. As I was telling you about uh, the hypertrophic basal septum, this is how you notice those changes, which I had said. Then there are a lot of other cardiomyopathies as well, like the dilated cardiomyopathies. So in the dilated cardiomyopathy with systolic dysfunction is not caused due to the abnormal loading or the coronary artery disease. However, it can also be seen in the familial forms, like the autosomal dominant ones, and also the non familiar dilated cardiomyopathies. So important thing is like, how to see, it, is it ischemic or non-ischemic? Ischemic, we already know like, if we can see a subendocardial or transmural scar, it will be called as a non-ischemic scar when there's late enhancement is absent or even like very faint, okay? So this is a typical example, okay? How is ischemic and how is a non-ischemic? Ischemic, as I said it, so ischemics, they will be having a subendocardial or transmural scar, right? And the non-ischemic, you do not see, uh, or there is late enhancement is absent, or even if it is present, it is really faint, and it is really limited to the mesocardial layers, which is septal or diffuse. So these are some more examples, how do you, uh, evaluate the left ventricle before planning for a therapeutic procedure. So it is really good for thrombus detection, and it has it is really uh, very sensitive. Uh, echocardiography is also really good, but it, there can be false negatives as well. You know, especially close to the apex. So now coming to the restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy. What is restrictive cardiomyopathy? We all I think know already that there's reduced ventricular filling and diastolic volume due to which the atria will be dilated there will be venous stasis although with preserved systolic function so systole, systolic function is preserved but atria is going to be dilated and there will be associated reduced ventricular filling and of course if ventricular filling is reduced then diastolic volume is also going to be uh, 
reduced as well. There can be familial type, the non-familial type as well. The non-familial ones include amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, or EF, the Anderson Fabry disease, or the carcinoid heart disease, or secondary anthracycline toxicity, or hyper eosinophilia as well. These are the individual diseases I think we all can speak later on in different sessions. So these are very important, uh, even when you are trying to comment about the iron overload of the myocardium as well. So this will be the typical example, okay? Uh, when you have already done the echocardiogram and all, and you will be able to see. So these are the various other uh, examples of the different types. And uh, this is the ARVD. ARVD as well, it's, there's a huge role for this. So you all can go through, uh, in fact, uh, because uh, left ventricle can be associated, especially in like almost 15% patients. And uh, there are some minor criterias and major criterias as well, and uh, which we all can definitely use, uh, like the typical ARVD patients. This is how it typically looks like. Now, for, because we are going short on the timing. Uh, and then finally, of course, the Takasubo. Takasubo is the one which is associated with apical ballooning syndrome, okay? Okay, so then there's also modified Mayo Clinic criteria for the diagnosis of Takasubo cardiomyopathy, uh, which uh, it, it is very important by using the transient hypokinesis, dyskinesis, or akinesis of the left ventricle segments. So finally, to summarize that this is very important and yes, it should be used as a Sub, uh, like complement, uh, so to use for accurate diagnosis of the patients as, as well. And uh, yeah, uh, 